Hi, okay, so this is the um, ecology chapter, chapter 18, introduction to both ecology and the biosphere. Um, ecology is, right, it is the study of the interactions between organisms and their environments. So we, what ecologists do is they look at that relationship that organisms have with their environment, how the environment influences the organisms and how the organisms adapt to the stresses and the different kinds of environments that they live in. Um, ecology or is a really great area to get into as we need more ecologists out there because the planet is rapidly changing um, with climate change and um, it's just a good field to get into so that we can have more data on what's happening and then we can make good decisions about what to do with the changes that's happening at the moment. So. When you are an ecologist, you have to consider two kinds of factors. Um, a, so there's going to be biotic factors, which are going to be the living things in that environment. And then we have an abiotic factor, which is non-living. So living things are pretty obvious. Um, I have some listed in your outline. Biotic factors are plants and animals in the area, but maybe we go smaller, right? So um, there are microbes in the soil. There's fungi um, in the soil. And there are, you know, animals include insects and, um, you know, many, many things that we can't really see with the, the naked eye. So, um, but anyways, all those things need to work together. They live in a certain area and that's your biotic factors, the factors that are alive. Now, what about the non-living factors or the abiotic factors, right? These are all the really critical parts of an environment that um, often dictates what kind of plants live there and what kind of animals live there, right? So if you look at the list um, on letter B in your outline, I've listed all your abiotic factors. So they are gonna be both chemicals, such as the pH of the water or the soil, or what kind of minerals you find in the soil. So there's chemicals, or even what kind of gases are in the atmosphere, right? If you have a, a factory close to an area that's spitting out pollutants or mercury, right? That's a factor, that's a chemical factor to that environment. And there's like physical factors, like how much water does it get? How hot does it get? Um, you know, is there a mountain range? Um, things like that. So let's, I'm just gonna run through it really quickly. But the first thing to remember is that um, all of these um, ecosystems uh, have to have an energy source. So on the planet Earth, on the surface, it's the sun. We've talked about this before, right? It's, the constant flow of energy, solar energy from the sun, the plants um, that we are going to call producers, they're going to produce the organic nutrients to sustain the entire planet. So the sun is the energy source on the surface, but if you're looking at the picture here on the ocean floor, there's another energy source, these hydrothermal vents, right? They, um, these organisms don't realize that there's a surface to the planet, um, and so they get their energy from these uh, this really super hot um, liquid that's spewing out of these um, areas rich with minerals. So let's just run through the um, abiotic factors. We have temperature, um, which I have affects metabolism for ectotherms. So remember, ectotherms are animals that their body temperature is the same as the ambient temperature. And so uh, if it's you're not gonna find ectotherms, very, very cold climates. Just think about the polar ice caps where you have polar bears, like in this first picture here, right? You're not gonna have lizards and snakes there because it's too cold for them. They, their metabolism just won't ever get up to a point where they can actually sustain life. Um, <clears throat> water, okay, is critical. Um, life has adapted many different tricks to retain water, such as the reptilian scales, right? Scales on your lizards and snakes, or uh, cuticles on leaves, for example. Then we have inorganic nutrients. Um, these are gonna be the chemicals found in both soil and in water. So um, we'll talk about phosphorus and nitrogen in a little bit, um, how they are limiting nutrients. That means that they, phosphorus and nitrogen are the two um, nutrients, right? Or elements that are in very, very small amounts in the soil and so they hold back the growth of um, plants. Um, pH is also a very critical inorganic nutrient uh, or factor. 
uh, uh, they're number six and number seven. So number six is just aquatic abiotic factors. So if you're a, a water living creature, you are uh, concerned with the oxygen levels in the water, the pH of the water, the salt concentration of the water, whether the water has strong currents or tides, or if it's a still water like a lake. Um, and then if you're on land, a terrestrial abiotic factor, right? terrestrial means land, then you have wind and you have evaporation and you have fires and storms and you have mountain ranges and different geographical, ge um, sorry, geological um, landforms that can influence the, the ecosystem. All right, so let's talk about um, this biomes. So this chapter basically moves through um, all of the biomes on the planet. So I want you guys to take a look at the um, definition of what a biome is. A biome is a major terrestrial or aquatic life zone. So it's a life zone that is characterized by the vegetation, so what kind of plants grow there, um, and physical environment. If, you're a, uh, if we're talking about an aquatic environment, we need to look at the like physical uh, in terms of like with the chemical makeup, um, what kind of water it is, salt water versus fresh water. So um, let's take a look at this breakdown. Aquatic biomes take up 75% of the Earth's surface. So the Earth is largely water, right? And you probably knew that. Um, so 75% of the Earth's surface is aquatic biomes. They're broken down into two categories, whether you have fresh water or if it's marine. Marine is your salt water, ocean water. Fresh water includes lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, and wetlands. And then marine is, of course, your oceans and your seas. Um, out of this, right, the marine is the hugest component of the 75%. If you look at the land, right, there's terrestrial biomes. You might recognize some of these, right? There's tropical forest, there's savanna, desert, chaparral, temperate grassland, temperate broadleaf forest, coniferous forest. The word coniferous just means um, you have a lot of pine trees or cone-bearing trees there. Uh, the tundra and the polar ice caps. So this chapter is going to just move through each one of these, and you'll want to recognize the different characteristics of each biome. Okay, so looking at our aquatic biomes, we have our first, I'm going to begin with freshwater. So freshwater biomes, what is the defin definition of freshwater? It's less than 1% salt. Um, it covers less than 1% of the earth, you guys. So there is not a lot of fresh water on the planet Earth. And uh, it covers less than 1% of the Earth, 0.01% of its water. And it harbors 6% of all the described species. So for as little as we have on the planet, it contains a whole bunch uh, of different species, right? It sustains a lot of life. And if you think about in your day-to-day -day, what water is used for, you use it for everything, right? Fresh water. We never use salt water. We only use fresh water. We use it to drink. We use it to cook. We use it to irrigate our crops. We use it to clean our um, homes and our cars. We pee in it. We flush it down the toilet. We use it for industry, right? So it's just used. Uh, it's all we use, right, in terms of water. And so it's very, very precious. Um, fresh water is extremely precious uh, resource that we have, and we cannot afford to contaminate or pollute this fresh water that we have, which is unfortunately what's happening in a lot of places in the planet. Um, they're polluting their fresh water sources. So let's talk about um, our lakes and ponds. When we have um, standing water, so you have a body of water that doesn't flow. It's, we're not talking about a river or a stream. We're talking about a lake, for example. Um, you're going to have these zones. So you're going to have a zone called the photic zone and an aphotic zone. And you might kind of know what these mean already. Photic is for photosynthesis, right? So in the picture, you would have the surface of the water to a certain depth where the sunlight can penetrate through the water and the sunlight can reach and support photosynthesis to a certain depth. 
after that, the wavelengths of light are not enough to sustain photosynthesis, so no photosynthesis will occur, and that would be the aphotic zone. So this next arrow down here would be the aphotic zone. The benthic realm is the floor. So just think about the very, very bottom is called the benthic realm. Um, the phytoplankton, phyto is referring to photosynthesis. They're going to be um, the algae and the bacteria. So the word plankton is just for these very small, they can be microscopic or, or very small, almost microscopic um, organisms that cover different groups of, of animals. So they can be, or, or bacteria and plants and algae. So they're, they're all, they're very diverse um, in terms of what, um, what kind of life form it is. It can be animal, plant, again, fungi, um, protist, and algae is a protist, right? So they're going to be on the surface, right, in this um, photic area. And it turns out that these are very, very sensitive to nitrogen. N is for nitrogen, and P is for phosphorus. So when there is a runoff from a, a certain farm or a area that's using um, nitrogen and phosphorus in the form of fertilizer, um, or if there's sewage, which is also very, very rich in organic nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, if that sewage or runoff gets into a standing water region, um, the algae and the bacteria, this phytoplankton tends to um, bloom, and that means that they uh, reproduce exponentially. There's a huge boom in their population, so the surface of the water can be completely covered with this um, photosynthetic um, organisms. Let me show you an algal bloom, right? So this is an algal bloom. So in this circumstance, um, it's very bad for the health of that body of water. Why? Because eventually these plants or algae or bacteria or whatever it is on the surface will die. When they die, they settle down to the floor of this body of water and they begin to decompose. This decomposition process actually depletes the oxygen in the body of water and will then kill the fish that depend on the oxygen content in that body of water. So whenever you see an algal bloom like this, it's never a good thing, right? It tells you that this um, body of water is in trouble of getting oxygen starvation and the living things in it <clears throat> may die. So uh, that's an algal bloom. And again, I just want to stress that this runoff in sewage is the primary causes of algal blooms where this body of water gets a huge sort of um, dose, right, of nitrogen and phosphorus, which were our limiting reagents, if you go back to that first part. Um, the limiting reagents hold back the growth of plants and photosynthetic organisms, but if you give it to them, they're going to take off. And so nitrogen and phosphorus are used in fertilizers, which is why runoff from areas that are farms or places where they use fertilizer, um, that runoff gets into the body of water, it can cause an algal bloom. Okay, let's talk about, let's talk about rivers and streams. So rivers and streams, um, they have a flow to them, right? They're flowing in one direction and generally support a lot of different communities of organisms um, quite different than your standing lakes and ponds. Um, and when you have a river or a stream, you have different little tiny microenvironments um, near the source of a stream and then downstream, the same stream can be very different from each other. Um, at the source of the stream, the water is usually very cold, it's clear, it's very fast moving and it's relatively low in nutrients because the sources of a stream are, are either snow melting, right? And the snow is just water. So when it, it doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. So where does the water get the nutrients? It gets it as it pulls, as it slides across the soil and it pulls the, you know, it does, you know, dissolves the soil and as it keeps moving, it's uh, exposed to more soil and so it picks up nutrients as it goes. But near the beginning of a stream, it just hasn't had time to pick up a lot of nutrients. So it's going to be relatively low in nutrients. However, downstream, the water is usually murkier because it's spent more time um, in contact with the land 
it's warmer, right? It's had time to warm up. Um, it's slower and it's higher in nutrients. Um, I was going to say, I think I forgot to say uh, that the source of a stream, it's either snow melt or it can be an underwater uh, spring. And then the water, the underground is not going to be very high in nutrients either. So you can have two different kind of environments um, at the beginning of a stream and downstream, and those will support different kinds of organisms. Okay, so keep that in mind and um, know that our dangers to streams and rivers have been really largely affected by pollution, by that runoff I was talking about. And then if it's a big river, um, dams have been used to control floods or to provide drinking reservoirs or to make power, to generate hydroelectric power. Um, this is an example of a river, the Columbia River, that had lots and lots of dams put in, right? So the, every red dot is a dam. And you can see that they really, <laughs> man has really disrupted this river. And this is, uh, in Washington, this is where the salmon will spawn. So this, they actually had to build fish ladders because the salmon is going to want to swim upstream uh, from the ocean and go, you know, to spawn and have babies. And so they had to put in a staircase next to the river since they dammed up the river. And uh, there we can see a little guy, a little salmon making his way upstream. All right, and then our next um, uh, sort of freshwater biome is a wetland. And wetlands are a transitional biome. So when you see the word transitional, this means that it's changing um, biomes, right? So we are at a meeting point between water and land. So it's between an aquatic ecosystem and a terrestrial one. So um, this is gonna support the growth of both aquatic plants, but also you have your land plants nearby. So whenever you see a transitional biome, this is gonna be a place that's very rich in species diversity, right? That means that you have a lot of different kinds of species here, whether it's plant or animal or whatever, because you have all these different kinds of environments. You have in the water or just a little water or you know completely dry, but in very close proximity to each other. So when you go and visit a wetlands, you're going to have a lot of diverse creatures there. Um, so in terms of wetlands, what are they used for? Migrating birds will use them a lot for a pit stop during their migration. Um, these areas can help reduce flooding because if you have a surge of water, then this water can get absorbed in the wet sort of soggy soil around the wetland and buffer it before it goes on to the actual land. Think about if you didn't have a wetland and it was water, then you sort of put in, um, you know, houses or something. There's no buffer for that, um, water if they have a flood so <clears throat> then the houses will get flooded and you have an increase of water but because you have soft soggy soil um, this area can buffer beyond it the the flooding then that soil since it is kind of spongy it can trap um, heavy metals in the sediment so that the the you know heavier metals and heavier pollutants can actually get buried in that sediment so those are some things about wetlands and you might think to yourself, are there wetlands in California? Yes. So uh, this got cut off, but this is uh, Bologna Wetlands in Marina del Rey. So you can actually go see um, at the marina, right? So this is, an, this is going to be um, water coming in from the ocean, meeting the land. All right, so let's go on to marine biomes. So marine is going to be a salt concentration of around 3%. So fresh water was 1%, marine is 3%. Marine biomes are going to be your oceans, your intertidal zones, your coral reefs, and your estuaries. Um, so again, right, looking at the pelagic realm. So on, for a marine biome, this word pelagic realm means the open ocean. So when you look at the surface of water, that's the pelagic realm. So... Um, we already talked about how that upper portion of the water is called the photic zone. So this is going to be the pelagic photic zone. Pelagic means the very, very surface. 
and uh, you have photosynthesis by phytoplankton and algae and it provides that first layer, the producer layer of uh, food for the entire ocean. So this is a really important um, photic area, right? Because it's going to be um, the, basically the plants of the ocean, right? The, the greenery, the, the parts that harness the um, energy of the sun to make sugars. That's the, the very first, what we call trophic level of the ocean. Um, so let's look at coral reefs. Coral reefs are found in these photic zones and of warm waters. And here's a picture of a coral reef. I think I have another picture of a coral reef for you here. Right, so it's really beautiful and really colorful. So corals are animals, you guys, and inside of the corals, they have living microbes that give the coral that beautiful color. And there's a symbiotic mutualistic relationship where they work together to live. And if the microbes inside die, the coral will die. So that is what is going on because the microbes that live inside of these corals are very sensitive to the temperature and the pH of the water. And with our, you know, the greenhouse gases and global warming increasing, the oceans are both getting warmer and more acidic because when carbon dioxide is um, in the environment, it dissolves in the ocean water. When it dissolves in the ocean water, it becomes carbonic acid. So the more carbon dioxide in the environment that gets into the water, the more acidic the water gets. So this is um, what can happen to coral reefs when there is um, a ch rapid change in both temperature and acid. Um, so I, I wrote down here that increase in CO2 dissolves in the ocean, increases the carbonic acid, the acidic pH kills the microbes that live inside the symbiotic coral animals, and then you get this bleaching. So this is a very unhealthy coral reef. Um, this is going on right now in Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Um, scientists are very scared that the barrier reefs, um, well, all the uh, coral reefs might be on their way out. Um, it's just a matter of time, which is really sad. So I'll put this link to this little, uh, the coral reefs could be gone in the next 30 years um, in your module so you can take a look at that. All right, so beyond the coral reefs, so let's take a look. There's the benthic realm, which is the bottom of the floor. And then we also want to know the intertidal zone, the continental shelf, and the twilight region. So for these three terms, I'm going to talk about them here. Right, so here's your ocean. So this is a good um, sort of diagram to look at for these areas, right? So remember the pelagic realm is the surface of the ocean. So it's the entire ocean. And then... Um, we have the photic zone, right, this upper part here that supports photosynthesis. So you see phytoplankton here. These, of course, depend on the sun. You see seaweed, which is also photosynthetic. <clears throat> and you have some corals um, in this area because the organisms in here can be photosynthetic as well. Um, then you have the animals that depend on the plants, right? So you're going to have animals that eat the green algae or the seaweed or whatever is on the or the phytoplankton zooplankton are also microscopic creatures that live on the phytoplankton okay so you have sort of an ecosystem all in the photic zone then when you go to the aphotic zone there is an area called the twilight area which is not enough light to support photosynthesis but some light does reach down here. So it's not enough for photosynthetic animals to be found, but you might have things like sponges, octopuses, whales, some fish. Then after that, there is the very, very dark, dark, dark ocean where there's absolutely no light, right? And you're gonna have different kinds of creatures down there. So um, let's look at these terms. So continental shelf is where the um, land is still shallow. So the ocean is still shallow, but right before it drops off into the deep, right? So that's our continental shelf. And then we have the intertidal zone here. So the intertidal zone is uh, where the tide, see how high tide, it's covered when it's high tide, it's not covered when there's low tide. So this intertidal zone is uh, a 
a biome all to itself because the organisms that live here have to be really, really hardy. Because if you think about it, half the day they're underwater, half the day they're not underwater. And then all of a sudden, if water disappears, now you can feel the heat of the day and it gets, starts to get dry, right? So these animals have to be very, very versatile. Um, and so we'll take a look at that. Let's take a look at this intertidal zone. So I'm going to play this um, clip for you. I'll, I'll put this in the module. In fact, you can pause this now um, and, and take a look at it. Um, but these are your, actually I might just make this into your lab. I'll probably just do that. Um, these are the places that you go for tide pools, right? So these intertidal zones, when the tide is out, and you go to the beach. This is the really interesting area where you can find a lot of different creatures. And the thing that they have in common is that they can attach to those rocks really, really uh, well, right? Because the tide is super strong. Uh, it's very violent at times, right? And it can really just, you know, take something off of the rock. So these creatures can all attach to the rocks. They also have adaptations that make them able to be in the hot sun without dehydrating and then also underwater. Um, and so they're very, very interesting creatures here. So um, the intertidal zone. And a classic um, organism here would be your sea stars or your starfish, right? And then you have things like barnacles and you have things like um, mussels and um, these anemones. All right, let's talk about an estuary. An estuary is a transition area between a river and an ocean. So water and water meet. So it's not, you know, it's, wetlands is water and land, and estuary is uh, water and water, but it's fresh water and ocean and salty water. So because you have two, this intermediate area, you, you can support a lot of diversity again. So you can have organisms that are in the salty water, you can have organisms that are in this middle range, and then we have some freshwater organisms. So <clears throat> it's one of the most productive areas on Earth. So what that means is that there's a lot of um, plants growing, and there's a lot of organisms like animals living on those plants. Um, and estuaries are now threatened by landfills and nutrient pollution. Um, a lot of oil spills happen in estuaries. Um, there's a contamination by pathogens or toxic chemicals such as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. So, uh, and there was another oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara. Um, but this is one of the biggest estuaries that we have um, in the United States, the Mississippi River meeting the ocean. So, right, the, the meeting of freshwater and saltwater, that's an estuary, huge. Um, estuary, and this is where we had that very large oil spill, this deep water horizon. So it is very productive, right? It's most productive areas. So when you spoil it, then all of those organisms are going to suffer. All that biodiversity could be lost. Okay, and this is a, another look at the deep water horizon spill and how this pelican is just completely uh, covered in oil. Okay, then we have a Morro Bay estuary up north. A nice picture of that estuary. All right, so we're gonna pause this here and move on to terrestrial biomes in the next segment.